a resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into an owner participation agreement with Catellus Development Corporation for the development of 220, 220 housing units at the East Bay Bridge Center on 40th Street, appropriating $3,500,000 from Fund 421, the 1995 Low Mod Housing Bond Fund, for the provision of affordable housing within the development and exempting the development from the requirements of the agency resolution number RD34-87 as amended by resolution number RD1-88. Patrick. Mary Ann will start us off on this one as well. The staff report before you recommends that the agency enter into an owner participation agreement with Catellus Development Corporation for the development of 220 housing units at the East Bay Bridge Center and also recommends appropriation of $3.5 million from the 1995 Housing Bond Fund to assist in financing the affordability component. Uh, a lot has happened since Catellus' first public presentations of their proposal to construct this housing uh, on their four vacant acres of land along 40th Street, uh, which was almost a year ago. Following a series of public meetings, which included the Housing Committee, the Redevelopment Agency, and the Planning Commissions of both uh, Emeryville and Oakland, and a chronology of all those various meetings is attachment A to your staff report, uh, Catellus has refined their proposal to the point at which we find it tonight. Some of the refinements uh, that Catellus undertook include their agreement to convert the development to condominiums in 15 years. Uh, they uh, dramatically uh, redid the facade to create a more articulated and less dense looking design. And there was a, uh, a lot of work done to enhance the landscaping and the <laughs> overall frontage along 40th Street. And all of these changes were made as a direct result of the community review process. Uh, last Wednesday on May 15th, the proposal went before the Emeryville-Oakland Joint Powers Authority Planning Council, and the entitlements which were requested at that time were granted by unanimous vote. Uh, there was actually quite a bit of praise both for staff, uh, for the staff work involved as well as for the project itself, and a copy of the environmental review uh, and JPA documents are attached to your staff report as attachment E and the agency will be requested to approve these documents tonight as well. The OPA before you is attached as Exhibit A to the resolution. Uh, it is a rather thick document and contains within it the forms of the documents which would be used to provide the agency funding, which would include a grant note, grant deed of trust, and grant regulatory agreement. Uh, I'll start by running down some of the key components of the OPA and then kind of enter dispersing into that the related parts of the grant documents at the same time and incorporated into this review would be a discussion of the project financing. Uh, starting off with affordability, the OPA stipulates that the project is 40% affordable to low income households and 60% market rate. The grant regulatory agreement uh, adds on to that requirement by requiring an additional affordability such that 10% of that 40% would be affordable to very low income households. This provision assures that the agency will be able to comply with its inclusionary re requirements under redevelopment law and also assist the city in meeting its ABEG fair share goals. The project financing is described in attachment number five to the OPA and essentially consists of multifamily revenue bonds, 4% tax credits, and agency funding, as well as Catellus contributing the land at a discounted value. An attachment C to the staff report provides a sources and uses table for the project. Starting off with the agency contribution, these funds would come from the agency's 1995 housing bond fund, and because these bond funds are tax exempt, they would need to be provided into the project as a grant. However, they would be subject to the grant documents with the deed of trust and regulatory agreement being recorded on the property. This serves as an enforcement mechanism for performance in certain areas such as maintaining the affordability, property management, tenant selection, transfer of property, as well as other issues. Uh, so there would be no payments uh, due on the agency's advance. However, should Catellus breach any of these types of provisions, it would become an event of default 
thereby enabling the agency to, to call the note once all the rights to cure have been um, exercised. The agency funds would also be provided to Catellus after construction has been completed. This greatly reduces the agency's risk and assures that the project was built in accordance with the approved specifications and conditions prior to the release of any agency funds. Uh, the next source of funding I'll discuss is the uh, multifamily revenue bonds. Catellus has already submitted an application to SIDLAC, which is the California Debt Limitation, Limit Allocation Committee. Uh, the SIDLAC meeting to hear that request would, be, uh, would take place on June 26th. Uh, they'll be requesting 23, uh, approximately $23 million in bond proceeds, which would be partially redeemed after the project is completed by both the agency's contribution and the expected $2.7 million in tax credit equity, and that would leave them with an outstanding balance of $17 million in debt. By bringing the tax credits in at the end, Catels can increase the yield that they would get from the investors, again, because they've reduced the risk. Uh, the bonds are expected to be credit enhanced by Fannie Mae, which will bring great stability to the project financing. And lastly, Catellus is contributing the land for a million dollars, which is $2.7 million less than their appraised value. Uh, the next big item in the OPA that's discussed, as well as in the grant documents, is the issue of conversion to condominiums. The OPA addresses it in its very first section on the purpose of the agreement, uh, and secondly, the OPA establishes a housing trust fund to provide financial assistance to the prospective low-income condominium buyers. It basically, it, it states that Catellus will contribute on an annual basis to this fund starting in year 6 through year 15 and that the fund will total $1.4 million by year 15. Uh, the provision for this is both in the OPA as well as in what's called the, the agreement to be recorded affecting real policy real property, excuse me, which is um, attachment number six to the OPA, and that agreement is recorded uh, on the property subsequent to the certificate of completion, at which point the OPA kind of expires, so it, it carries on certain provisions of the OPA after, after it has expired, but through the life of the project. Uh, the hammer for making these payments is that Catellus agrees to not take a property tax exemption for the low-income units unless they have contributed to the fund. Uh, Catellus has uh, intended uh, some time ago to bring in a nonprofit partner both to assist it with the compliance work for the affordable units as well as assist it with the sale of the affordable units and uh, an additional benefit of bringing in the nonprofit partner is that it will allow them to take this property tax exemption for the 40% affordable units. So again, they agree to not take it unless they put into the fund. So it's kind of an economic hammer to assure that they put into the fund. Uh, the trust fund would be held by the agency and administered by the agency at its own discretion for the first time home buyer assistance for the buyers of the affordable units. Should there be some reason why the conversion doesn't take place uh, at year, right after year 15, Catellus uh, may decide that it does not intend on converting the units and at that point the money in the fund would revert back to the agency for its use to promote housing opportunities elsewhere. Uh, however, there is a provision for a two-year grace period uh, during which Catellus and the agency may jointly decide to continue holding on to the trust fund and during this two-year period, Catellus must make annual contributions of $100,000. By year 18, if the market is still not right for condo conversion, the agency may either elect to continue holding on to the trust fund uh, on an annual basis with a $100,000 annual contribution, or it can elect to have the funds revert uh, to itself for use in, uh, for other housing activities. The grant regulatory agreement provides for a condo conversion plan in its section 5, and that's to be prepared in year 13 and requires agency approval. And the plan would basically start the process for determining if there is a market to convert in year 15. Uh, it's to describe the feasibility for converting, uh, to describe how the affordable units would be sold, it should describe a marketing plan, procedures for providing the first right of refusal to existing tenants, and would also describe special financing terms for the affordable units. Um, the final mechanism regarding the conversion issue 
is uh, that one of the conditions of approval, which was passed last Wednesday night by the JPA, requires that a tentative condo map be submitted for approval prior to the issuance of a building permit. So they have to do that before they can get a building permit. Uh, in these various ways, uh, there are incentives and hammers to induce Catellus to convert after the 15 years. Uh, in addition, Catellus itself has clearly stated its intention to do so as long as the market is there. An additional issue which is addressed in the OPA is a desire to seek exemption from the agency's prevailing wage resolution. The requirement that the entire project comply with prevailing wages would substantially change the financial structure requiring additional public assistance. Uh, none of the other current sources of financing trigger uh, prevailing wage. Uh, Catellus's contractor has costed out the difference between prevailing and non-prevailing wages and finds that there's a minimum 10% difference. Uh, the agency also hired the firm of Adamson and Associates to do a cost analysis of the contractor's estimate. And in addition to confirming that the construction costs were uh, in line and not inflated, they also confirmed that differential of 10%. Finally, the OPA includes a schedule of performance as its attachment number three and there's a separate timeline that is attached to the staff report as attachment B. And essentially it has the uh, project going before SIDLAC in June uh, with the bond documents going before the agency in July, bond closing in August, and start of construction in September with an 18-month construction period uh, and the beginning of leasing in January 98. Uh, in addition, the grant documents contain language which is similar to other restrictive documents that the agency has previously used in other housing developments with regard to property management standards and tenant selection standards. The request for funds in the amount of $3.5 million is the amount which was initially estimated by Catellus last year. The cost per affordable unit is $40,000, which is comparable with, and in some cases, less than other developments which the agency has funded. The decision to refund the earlier housing bond, um, there, which, which gave us additional resources, anticipated the use of those funds for this development, and the affordable housing program also includes this development with 220 units at $3.5 million. Uh, the uh, city's housing element update identifies the site as a potential site for housing development. And finally, the site was set aside for housing pursuant to the East Bay Bridge MOU, and now uh, the proposal before you uh, could, could actually make it happen. Uh, that concludes my staff report, and just to clarify, the resolution uh, before you asks for approval of the execution of the LPA, the appropriation of the $3.5 million from the Housing Bond Fund, approval of the mitigated negative deck, and exemption from agency resolution RD1-88. Uh, agency Member Bukowski, just a moment. Uh, Mr. Biddle, is it uh, appropriate for us to be lumping all these rather major actions in one resolution? Is it defensible? Yes, I mean we're clearly dealing with the the one one project, and all of these issues relate to this this project. The actions before you are one to approve the participation agreement, and a component subcomponents of that are the funding and the uh, prevailing wage issue. Okay, uh, agency member Bukowski. Yeah, yes, I had a, a number of questions um, on the conversion issue. Can't um, we look at the feasibility of converting before 15 years? I mean, we don't know what the market's going to do, and if we look at it and it's not feasible, it's not feasible, but we could still look at it earlier, like they said when they made the initial presentation. Um, I know that there was an earlier date, I think it was in the fall, when the affordable housing program was first discussed and the issue of ownership housing was discussed at some length, that there was a statement that Catellus felt that they might be able to do that. They said they would explore it. Uh, I believe we brought back to the agency at a meeting of a later date the fact that uh, all the different legal advice that was received from a variety of sources indicate that with the source of financing that they're using, there is there would be a prohibition uh, prior to the 15 years. Okay, so even if, <clears throat> even if the market changed and all of a sudden that became feasible, couldn't they cash out the, the one loan and then take another? Uh, no, the multifamily revenue bonds establish a compliance period that is um, really without um, uh, any connection to the actual repayment of the bonds. 
Okay. Um, uh, okay. Now, how much experience does Catellus have at managing housing projects? Uh, I don't know anything about the, the history. This mm -hmm. is going to be 40% uh, mm -hmm. low income, right? Yes. They are going to be, at this point, they are intending to engage the firm of Saris Regis. That is a fairly renowned uh, um, uh, company that does uh, quite a bit of ha uh, management of uh, housing, property management, as well as construction. Um, that is identified in the grant regulatory agreement. It specifically identifies that Catellus is going to engage that firm. We have reviewed that firm's um, uh, profile, and should they decide to select another firm, we would have the ability to review that selection before they made it. Okay, now if everything with the project turned out to be a disaster, Catellus could bail out and the city would take it over, is that right? Is that what I got out of the documents? Something like that? That we. Would, would we take, take it, it over if they defaulted on, on, on a number of, uh, of the requirements? It would not be us taking it over, no. It would be a bank, I assume. Okay. Um, their whoever, default, whoever loaned them the, the primary loan. Okay. Their default of our provisions would enable us to call our $3.5 million. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a pretty big project, so we want to make sure that it's managed properly and uh, that there's no problems. Absolutely. And uh, in addition, when you mentioned about the affordability, that was one of their reasons for bringing in a nonprofit housing developer specifically to address the affordability compo component, the compliance issues. They're fairly um, rigorous, so they have been thinking about that. Now, in, with respect to the documents, uh, the tenants, I know that right now we get a number of complaints from the Besker building about the East Bay Bridge Shopping Center, the sweeping machine, and all kinds of other things. So you may want to put some kind of disclosure in there that the tenants realize that there's activities next door and that the sweeping machine cleans in the middle of the night or whatever, because we do mm -hmm. get complaints about that. Um, and the other thing is, if we can uh, use all these funds right now for to... Um, um, subsidize this project, then if we wanted to have housing in Del Monte, there, there would be no funds available to subsidize that. Is that right? Uh, well, according to the five-year plan that the agency uh, just recently revised and endorsed, that's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Vice, uh, Vice <coughs> Chair Cassis. Thank you. I'm, and I'm sorry I had to be absent for some of your presentations, so if I hit something that you covered, I, I've, I've read as much of the material as I could, but not all by any means. Uh, a couple of questions I had. Um, going to the bottom, actually, of, of, the, uh, of the memorandum of the first page, uh, I'm, I'm just not um, sure on, on what we're talking about in terms of, of security. Um, this, this speaks to... Um, Police department standards in terms of hardware and and uh, parking access and those kinds of things. I, I really didn't see anything that discussed what kind of on-site security the project itself would have. Uh, is there somebody that can speak with regard to, that? to personnel? You mean? Yeah. Yes, okay. I'll have uh, this is Steve Cups from Catellus. I'll have him address that. Thanks. Um, Susan Anstead from Saris Regis is also here with us this evening. So, Susan, if I say something that's not right, uh, come up and slap me. Um, Better you get up now and just stand there. You don't <laughs> want to have to walk all the way up there. <laughs> um, my wife, I, uh, I already had it happen once. Oh, yeah. um, the, uh, the garage, as you know, will be secured, and it will be card entry um, you know, in, into the parking garage, so all of that will be gated. Uh, similar um, you know, card entry access to the project itself um, we will have uh, dawn to dusk uh, security. Um, Susan, is that is that correct? So, and then uh, uh, t usually 24 hours on the weekend, correct? Okay. So dawn to dusk, secu uh, full-time security guard, and then uh, full-time on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Um, it, you know, during construction, we'll have you know a similar a similar program, dawn to dusk security, and you know we'll have two or three security guards depending on what what stage of the construction we're involved in. What what I don't understand the the limitation of the dawn to dusk during the week. I mean that that doesn't seem to really it, it, well I mean it's it's fairly standard in the industry. I mean during the daylight hours you've got enough resident activity coming and going within the project plus you've got um you know a full-time manager uh you know on site in the office at that time. Um, in all the projects that I've been involved in, it's been a dawn to uh, a dawn to dusk issue. Susan, I don't know if you have any. Oh, no, I, that's correct. Uh, we have 
Yeah. Maybe you need to call because we are we are on the tape here. Thank you. Should it be dusk to dawn? I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I assume that that's what we were talking the flip side. Well, on a project this size and with the controlled access and the people that are working there on site during the day, we don't feel that there would be a need for security to be there during the day. Certainly, if that were to change, we would modify. Yeah. I, I just I I just have to say from the outset, I think that's really unrealistic. I, I think you need to get with with our police chief if that hasn't happened, and take a look at what's happening in the shopping center out the back door during daylight hours. Okay. And, and I think I think your impression of that might change rather rather dramatically. I really believe that there needs to be 24-hour security there, and, and the project needs to account for that from the beginning. And I'm talking about seven days a week. Even with Ooh. the controlled access that we have to the site, it's a, somewhat different than a retail use. Well, what I have uh, asked for, um, Vice Chair Cassis, is a closer to TV, which is being um, uh, monitored with tape backup so that if an incident takes place, we can quickly go to that uh, incident uh, for evidence purposes and, and apprehension purposes. So I think you know we, there have been some discussions about hardware, lighting, uh, as well as the security, the gated access to the parking, as well as to the building, good lighting. So I think that you know that there's. I, I think they have it under control. It's something that certainly bears watching carefully, though. I, I guess following along in Vice Chair Cassis's comment, um, I'd be interested to know where, what other locations uh, do you have? under management uh, projects of this size, developments of this size? Okay, um, our company manages just about 13,000 units in four states, and um, we're an accredited management organization through the Institute of Real Estate Management. Do you have any other urban developments of this size that you're managing? That's my specific question. Oh, um, off the top of my head, you down in San Diego? Bay oh, yes, we're all over Orange County. Okay. Yes. okay. Yes. Stockton, San Mateo, so Mountain View, yes. Yeah. Um, probably the closest property to this that I've managed um, personally would have been City Heights in San Francisco, and we did not have security during the day. The only time we hire security during the day is if there's, um, you know, a specific threat because we do have our employees on the site during the day mm -hmm. and um, and it's all controlled access. Yes, yeah, right. There's the no design reason of the building. You couldn't use the security from the uh, retail center, right? It's the same company. Same I'm owner. sure if, if it proved necessary, we would definitely explore co-oping that service. Well, what I would like to suggest also, Madam Chair, is that uh, in the rental agreements, um, uh, conviction uh, or, or arrest and conviction for uh, any kind of drug trafficking or crime of violence would be immediate grounds for uh, eviction. Uh, those are the kind of things that you know I think will enhance uh, the well-being of all of the tenants there. That is specifically addressed in our standard rental agreement. You know, your I guess standard rental agreement says use of the premises for any illegal activity. Oh, okay. He's well, talking about one of your one of your tenants gets busted at the Emeryville Marketplace for a drug activity, you're going to evict them from your unit. That's not something that we typically do. Yeah, I, I, I thought you were talking at cross right, purposes there. You mean conviction of a felony or you mean just a misdemeanor? No, I, I, I would I want any kind of uh, drug activity uh, on or off the premise would be a basis for eviction. And, and that but I'd like to change what you, the, the language you normally use uh, because that... It's not uncommon for a, a gated premise like this that you're developing to become a safe house for a drug dealers, and you, you don't want that uh, sort of uh, tenant in your property. So it's not so much that they're just committing illegal uh, activities on your property as that they are engaged in illegal activities elsewhere. So you want to cover that as so well. So you mean conviction of a felony, right? Yes, a, a violent felony or, or drug trafficking. Okay. We'd obviously need to figure out whether legally we can do that yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a, a problem with the concept, Chief Coletti. And there's fair housing laws and legal issues that we'd have to look into, but I mean, yeah, our, yeah. our concern is the same as yours. We yeah. don't, what we I've don't. described has been tested and uh, withstood. 
challenge. Okay. Well, we'll 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 look look into strengthening that provision then. I guess what I'm encouraging here is that you know a lot of times when when you're moving forward to these projects, everything's budgeted and you know sometimes we're kind of tight uh, in terms of what can be done and can't be done. And I just think you really need to to look at the flexibility at least to go to full time security without you know being able to you know ha have a long delay if that becomes necessary that you can get it now. And have it for a lengthy period of time, if necessary. Uh, I, I really think you need that flexibility built into what you're doing, and, and I'd like to see that happen. Well, I, I mean, we'll have to do we'll have to do a downside or a, a revised financial analysis to see what impact that would have, because obviously it would okay. it would impact the debt that could be underwritten. Um, I, I mean, what I would like to do is suggest that we move forward with the program that we've all discussed here and we've worked with Chief Coletti on. And if I mean we're going to be talking together anyways, if there's a problem that you know at that point in time, if we determine that 24-hour security is an absolute necessity, that you know we would uh, we would incorporate it into the yeah. program. Obviously, we want people to feel safe and comfortable there, right. and, and well, I mean, they're, they're going to feel that's... better if it's necessary that they know that there's somebody there. Uh, that, that that's going to be something that we would initiate anyways. I mean, if we've got a situation that's you know impacting our ability to, to rent the units, it's in our best interest to. Uh, to put forth that program as well. Thank you. I, I had a couple other questions okay, I'd like to ahead. pursue. Marianne, maybe this is more for you. Thank you both. Um, in terms of, again, the, the the right of first refusal and the, and the conditions, wh when would we see those in the, in, in the process? Uh, the way it's written now, it would be uh, they would need to present to us for our approval in year 13 the, all the procedures for converting. Why couldn't that be done up front? Why, why does that have to wait to year 13? Uh, well, I mean, we're approving mm -hmm. a project now mm -hmm. that's designed to convert, and and right now, while Dick Cassis sits here on the city council, and he certainly won't be here in 13 years, I'd like to be able to that's to have said 13 some, years ago. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have some impact on, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be written and granted. It's not mm -hmm. like if things mm -hmm. don't change that, that they can't react mm -hmm. to the times. But there's certain, again, maybe it's from the battles of the Watergate conversion that I, I still want to see some, some protections mm -hmm. written in to the agreement. And, and I would feel better being able to impact that now rather than hoping that the people in 13 years who, who wouldn't have been around during Watergate and seen what happened in the city uh, are, are long gone. What can you sort of expand? What what in particular you want? Well, to I, I've talked I've talked a lot here about these kinds of things and the things that happened at Watergate in terms of what has to be you know the way the property has to be brought up to uh, you know conversion standards at the time uh, the the approval processes for that how that's all going to work uh, ensuring the right of first refusal and that the developer will not hold back any units uh, for a later market. Sale if if uh, they think that that's feasible that's one of the things that happened at Watergate is because they're you know obviously you want to sell all the units Watergate thought they were going to have a hard time selling their units and all of a sudden they found out they could sell the whole project at once and and magically uh, 250 units disappeared off the market uh, and the developer held those and I, and I don't I don't mean that you're you're them, but there's a temptation at times to, to have people grab a hold of things if they think they can make a better profit in six months or a year. And I don't want to I don't want to see those kind of things happen again. And, and it was rather done with impunity because there was nothing that prohibited them from doing it. The, the words that were spoken right from this podium uh, at that time were, "It's our it's our project, and we'll do what we want. And those units are not going to be put on the market. Uh, we're going to we're going to sell them at phase two. And and I just want to be sure that." Those kinds of things are protected against. Uh, well, I know in terms of the first right of refusal, that's required under law to be part of their lease. So it, it is, Mike, but the way Watergate got around that was that when the units came became emptied by people, because it was just rental, and, and as renters moved out, if it was a unit that the developer wanted to hang on to, they just didn't put another renter in there. They left them vacant. Uh, or, or they put friends of the developer in there. Uh, they they had a lot of schemes that they used when they realized that and, and, and those kind of forces may not happen here. I mean the the conversion took a lengthy period of time and that time market prices were going up and the phase one prices that they had published were then sitting out there at, at well below market. So everybody that bought at phase one got a good price. 
and, and the developer saw that and, and said, we don't want to sell prime units that we can grab onto at phase one price. We'd rather sell them at phase two price, and, and they succeeded in doing that. Well, I guess on the one hand, there's no, I mean, this project may never, in fact, convert. That's true. So you may be going through a whole effort for, for nothing. Um, the second thing is that, which is different here than I suppose with, with Watergate, is that the the conversion plan and how that's supposed to happen, the approval of it sort of vests here with this body. So, I mean, although Dick Cass's council member may not be here, then there's going to be somebody else, and hopefully they can... Um, you know, take care of those concerns now. Well, I, just, um, I just, you know, I mean, if we can, I, I imagine we can probably put together some uh, some items that uh, that it should at least address. I just don't know that we're going to be able to cover everything. I, and I don't expect a fully comprehensive document. But again, my concern is is that that. In 13 years, there may be nobody here who suffered the scars of, of the Watergate conversion. Mm -hmm. And having, you know, learned from that experience, I, I would rather, you know, make sure that it doesn't happen again. And again, I'm, I'm not, you know, these these people may not be here in 13 years. I mean, everybody's in good faith now. We're all working on this together. We're all on the same team. But people change and things change. And you know, at that time, uh, you know, we're back in the old days where somebody controlled the city council, and and they went right along with things. So just saying that there'll be a council here uh, that that can be trusted I and am. everything will happen, I I don't know that that's true. I would hope. I'm a trustful person. I, well, and, and and generally I am too. But you know, it's it's that old saying about those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Uh, I I would like to ensure to to the degree possible that we have put protections in for the people that are there, and and I recognize that. Conditions may change in 13 years. There may need to be additions and revisions to that. But for one, and maybe I'm the only council member that wants to do it, and if so, we'll move on. Well, but can I would like to see could, some could I just respond to that a little? Because uh, I think we, uh, you and I, uh, both as owners at Watergate, went through those battles. We know how horrendous they were. But that was about 10 years ago, and we're talking about 13 years in the future. So we are trying to solve a problem that that is essentially 23 years 23 years old in a new world tie up the hands of a council at that time uh, to uh, just be overly protective my concern here is you add this kind of complexity to this document which is already overly complex no offense to the lawyers uh, but uh, do it, it comes back down do we want a project that can move forward or do we want to keep adding layers to protect people 13 years down the line when actually if you look at this document this provides a very strong basis for uh, uh, the agency and the, the council to uh, approach the problem you cannot protect people in the future I don't think by, by adding complexity now, uh, and I and I my question is, uh, what what about going out to the financial markets by tying hands even further? Uh, I I'm very uneasy about that. Yeah, can we require a conversion? I, I'm not comfortable with the idea that you know it may not convert because I think it's the intention of the council to have it convert or that we wanted condominiums. Well, I mean, you can't force people to buy condominiums, Ken. Right. I mean, it makes no sense to put markets on the unit if nobody's going to buy them. Well, so. why, okay. Uh, no, I mean, why? No one's going to be buying places in 13 years. I, I would hope so, but the, it depends on what the market conditions are like. From what I understand at the present time, the market conditions aren't such that that it would support for sale housing right now, and that's why you're not seeing that at this time. Certainly so. not condominiums for sale. I mean, w one of the things we're trying to do is get people that move here that are interested in the community, and, and we don't see that with renters, and we're willing to say, well, okay, you know, if it can't be for 13 years, but um, I don't know, isn't there enough cost recovery on it to make it much more financially feasible in well, 13 that, years? Or? That's sort of the 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 thought behind the, the trust fund is to try and help uh, provide a financing vehicle for those units which presumably will be the harder ones to to get rid of or to market or to sell, which is the affordable units. 
So, so almost no matter what the climate of the lending agency is, there would there would be money there to, to allow the conversion. It'll be there'll be money there, hopefully to to help along the process of converting. But again, it may you know the money in that trust fund may not be enough to you know could tell us or may say, well, I'm sorry, it still just does not make financial sense to convert at this time because nobody's going to buy them. Okay, so what maintains the 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 low income affordably affordability of the units if it goes past 15 years? What happens in year 20 or 25? Who subsidizes those low income units? No, they are restricted. Those units are always going to be, there's a provision that requires them to be restricted to low and uh, very low income units for a period of, I believe, 59 years. 55. 55, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. Mayor, if I could, yeah. I, I just want to go back. I, I, again, I, I want people to understand I'm not trying to make this document longer or more complicated than it is. I'm trying to work some protections into it that I don't think would make it any more complex. If anything, it, it, it's basically a tenant's rights kind of protection is what I'm striving for so that, that people really do get their rights of first refusal. And, and it's not a total parallel to Watergate because Watergate was a much bigger conversion than this is going to be. And there wouldn't, uh, particularly with the affordable housing units in there, there wouldn't be the kind of, of ability to, to manipulate the, the product as there was then. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, pe people change and, and motivations to make a lot of money can, can change the way things come about. So I, I would prefer to see it there, but if I'm the only one that wants to do that, I will, I will stop at that point. Um, I have two other items, though, that I'd like to that I'd like to bring up. Um, would you explain to me a, a little more fully what happens to the million dollar um, trust fund? Uh, I understand that if it doesn't convert, that that reverts to the city to be used for housing elsewhere. And and what happens to it if it does convert? It would be used. It would be held by the agency, uh -huh. and the use of it would be administered by the agency to provide specifically provide. Uh, first-time home buyer assistance to the buyers of the affordable units. Okay. And the, the amount of money that's there is based on a calculation, based on our experience of what um, low-income home buyers need to bridge the gap, uh, understanding that the sales will be uh, based on affordable sales prices. It's right. not to bridge the gap between a market rate sales price. That's a, that's a terrific provision, and whoever came up with that idea and worked that in, uh, my compliments. I, I think that that's, that's the kind of thing that I really like to see. Um, I, I want to follow up on, on something that, uh, that Ken brought up earlier, the warnings uh, to people. When we, when we approved, uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe the never-to-be-built Bussy project, which was going to be adjacent to the, to the marketplace, uh, we went through a lot of discussion at that time about putting warnings uh, in, in the rental agreements for people. Again, it doesn't mean that it will prevent them from coming here and complaining, mm -hmm. but we've seen it happen with the, the building of Emory, Emory Bay Village next to AC Transit, and, and I know Ken was very concerned about it with the Bussy Project coming in right next to the marketplace, and certainly this coming in next to a shopping center. And, I, and I, I'd like to see us carry forward some of those same warnings that we had worked out, because I think there was some good wording uh, that, that we were going to require of that project. That would uh, that would serve ourselves well here if that's not already part. I see some smiles. Are, 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 is, is that already being contemplated? Or um, no, I was just thinking back to those wonderful days. Right. Um, I mean, you know, if before somebody moves someplace, they obviously ought to explore where they're going. But people always don't. And rather than you know having a bunch of people come traipsing in here once it's fully rented to complain about the the people cleaning the parking lot and the delivery trucks at all hours and cars slamming their doors and headlights shining. Uh, you know, I think it's just good that, that people have to initial someplace on the rental agreement that they've been informed that, hey, look out the back door, folks, there's mm -hmm. there's a shopping center over there. Well, that's the building complaints now about East Bay Bridge. So. <laughs> they do? Yeah, they do. Have to me. Uh, a few residents, two residents, I believe, have complained from the Bedford building. Well, that's a complaint, isn't it? Well, we, we will certainly look into that and see what we can use from prior prior work. Are there any other comments from the agency? Greg. Yes, I have uh, um, three three uh, concerns. You know, I'll sort of take them in uh, reverse order of importance in my own mind. Uh, one is I sort of uh, agree with the community economics 
concern there that was cited when they did the financial analysis only to a partial extent they said that they expressed a concern regarding the agency's granting of the funds when Catellus was going to make money off the deal in the long term and then it went in there um, I'm I agree to that to the ex only to the extent of 1.2 million dollars of our uh, grant and that is because um, there's, the de there's going to be a developer fee the developer paying themselves a fee of 1.2 million dollars when the grant um, uh, is executed or sometime close to that and that's now what the FDIC calls a pre-extraction of profits which is the thing that got the savings and loans into so much trouble across the country when developers were essentially pre-extracting profits that would normally go to a developer at a time when the development would have pa positive cash flow or at a time when the development would be selling and have capital gains and so I feel that um, if it were possible that de that developer be sh we should do one of two things with it <clears throat> either it, it should be paid back at some time in the future when the developer is making or has made lots of money already and at that point it's, there's, it springs forth and says well remember the 1.2 million we loaned you of those profits that you're now taking that should be uh, that should be paid back or else there should be a protection put in there that that fee is not paid until essentially the project is leased up at least you know, it's something that says you've got 90% of the units going, you're probably in the black in terms of a cash flow situation. Um, and the rest of the funds, the rest of our $3.5 million, I think, prop properly left a, a pure grant. But I think in the case where you've got a developer extracting a fee for their own development up front, then it's obvious that the connection of that and your grant is pretty close to it that the agency has a good nexus in which to say we need to treat that specially and that what those are my two suggestions one of those uh, those two things that we might do um Greg can we just stop there before we go yeah. on is there is there any reaction to that from staff Cause um well i think in terms of the first suggestion um with regard to being paid back i w i would be happy to put that question to uh the attorneys who work with us on the uh, um, housing bond that we did, but my understanding is that we are really unable to get paid back in any way um, from from the developer. Um, that they would create a nexus that would jeopardize the tax exempt status of the bonds. Um, okay. I'd be happy to see if there's some nuance there that I'm missing uh, with that. Uh, Obviously, we can be paid back if there's a default. On, on our deed of trust, then it calls all of a sudden our grant then springs to a loan and we're paid back. Right, for, for, for performance. You know, right. So there has to be, there's some exceptions that they make. So I, I can check on that with regard to the second suggestion. Um, you know, I, I don't see a technical problem with that. Um, of course, we'd have to go back and talk to the developer about how they were intending to draw down their developer fee. Do you want to comment on that, Steve? Sure. The structure is exactly as uh, agency member Harper has described. We take down 25% when it closes, and the balance, this is really driven by our, our uh, bond underwriters, the balance is driven is, is taken down when we perform, uh, when we complete the project, and you know the project meets the, you know, the, uh, the quality that's represented in the construction drawings. And then there's a, you know, there's at that point 50%, and then the remainder is taken down as soon as the project is leased up. And so it is very performance oriented. It's tied to us completing the building the way we're supposed to, and then getting the building leased up. And if we don't do those things, we don't get, we don't get paid. Um, and so in essence, it stays, it stays in the project. Um, in terms of the, the, you know, the reasonableness of the fee, um, tax credit projects, in the city of San Francisco that are have a much lower number of units um, are drawing out fees of 1.2 million dollars on a per unit basis 
the, the fee that we're representing that we're, that we're, that's in the project is you know, below, below market. And the last point is that we are, in essence, paying back, if you will, to the project trust fund in the, you know, in basically $100,000 a year starting in, in year six. And the Mary Ann's estimates calculate that that fund would be worth $1.4 million at the end of year 15. So I, mean, I, I think we've tried to, I mean, I, I, obviously it's, a, it's an issue, and I think we've tried to, to deal with it in a way that's, you know, that's fair to, to all of us. We're compensated to perform. If we perform, we get paid. The fee is, is less than what I've seen and, and have, uh, you know, experienced in other projects with affordable units in them. And then lastly, the, the project trust fund, you know, which, you know, a lot of the credit should go to Mr. Harris, um, in essence, accomplishes I think what you're what you're suggesting, and it also accomplishes it provides a tremendous incentive for us to convert because that becomes a vehicle, but which you know we can tap into in terms of converting those affordable units into home ownership units in year in year 15. Yeah, well, it's just somewhat alleviated by the uh, the bond lenders, and I don't blame mm -hmm. them for rationing out um, your developer fee. I still would prefer. A check on on the the first option if it's possible, but that would alleviate me. That would alleviate my concern if the first option is not possible. Well, I, I will do that, and I guess with regard to the second point, it it should be um, reiterated that the agency funds would not be drawn down until after construction, um, yeah. and we would be bringing you, of course, the bond documents at a later date that would uh, call out the provisions uh, that Steve has just described. And if they don't, we'll be sure they do. Mm -hmm. Agency member Bukowski. Oh, did you have some more? Well, I can, I can get to it any, any other time. Do we have any ability to uh, approve of the management of the of the property? I mean, suppose we get a manager there that the city just doesn't like, can we? We do have approval rights over the firm. Uh, if you're speaking of a specific employee no, of the, the firm, firm, of the firm, yes, that's that's provided for in the grant regulatory agreement. Um, my uh, second. Uh, concern and uh, a little more serious is that of uh, of the design. When this first came forward, um, I asked the question of the developers. Uh, in, in in comparing this, and I and I want to say right off front, it is not by any stretch of the imagination nearly as bad as Emory Bay Apartments. Um, but I am. You know, I proudly cast the sole vote against Emory Bay Apartments, and since then I have heard from fellow council members and many, many other people in the city that they wish more people would have listened to me. But I think that housing over parking um, may be, in large part, sort of passe in terms of long-term desirability for people who want to buy units. Um, I think that there was a time when Watergate was built um, that, that 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 was not a problem, and that it was certain uh, there was a market for it there. I don't know if there's any condominium conversions taking place of those sorts of units, and I think Emory Bay Apartments is a good example. Um, the other day, uh, me and the mayor and the and the city manager were together, and I said, well, "Emory Bay Apartments has 20 percent of this city's population." Can any of us name three people who live there? And we only came up with one between the three of us. And that's that's my problem, in essence, with 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 living over parking. And let me say, this design is as good as you can do it. Um, and and I certainly want to congratulate them on that subject. So it's a very fundamental thing that you know that I'm that I'm talking about here. And I think in terms of rental and getting people here, for example, people who, you know, Catella, uh, Chiron hires or Sybase hires and are coming from other places uh, in the country, I think there will be a market um, for these units in, in, in rental. And I don't think it will be quite as bad as Emory Bay Apartments, which are 65% students attending. Cal and all sorts of things. You're going to have a heavy contingent of that, but I don't think it would be that bad. Um, I really question whether these will ever convert, uh, unless 
I think the attitude toward what people are now looking for um, in buying uh, changes. And I think it's very, very important to the community around there that I've talked to and the council members that, that those units do convert and do um, uh, convert with some ease. Um, I, I think that uh, that there's just there's just going to be a problem there. And the uh, the the third my third concern um, is is really not about this project at all or about uh, but about the whole the agency and the council member Bukowski brought it up. Um, this project absorbs a lot of our available um, affordable housing funds, uh, more than more than half. In fact, this, these two projects absorbed them all from the nine, 1995 uh, fund. And I want and I would before I would spend that kind of that kind of money on this project, I would want to revisit the the housing concept that we had um, five years ago for the Del Monte project that everybody, community everything, was very enthusiastic about. I think one of the reasons that everybody's enthusiastic is the ground based housing about 400 units and you know had had the little alleyways and everything and I, I, it was a wonderful design and we never offered never offered a cent toward that development and and I and I would just like to um, compare you know offering it to Catella to anybody now that we know that Kaiser or pretty sure that Kaiser is is not going in fact they didn't take their option Del Monte now owns the property um, uh, is, I think we owe it to ourselves to study that because in 1987, um, Sedway Cook, when they set out the, gen the city's general plan, they looked at that area and they say there's where you should put housing. And I still agree with that. I think a problem with this housing site is that it's it's isolated and it's and it's not exactly cozy. Um, you know, you look out under this vast parking lot on one side, this. You know, very arterial, four-lane street um, on another, and then these just these expanses. And it's it, it, as compared to the Del Monte site, which is very enclosed and can be very neighborhood-like. I think it's inferior, and and I don't mean. And this is not faulting the project at all. This is faulting us. And I was trying. To, I've been trying to get the capital improvements program ahead of this, so we could discuss this issue and get this worked out. Um, you know, before this came up, um, but I was unable to do that. But I, I think that that's that's my main uh, objection to this. I, I want to say that uh, whereas in in the past I've been noted for my antip antipathy to Catullus and had, had been rightly quoted as saying they couldn't develop their way out of a paper bag, these folks know what they're doing. This new staff, these these are pros and really good people, and I think that on balance. This is as good a project you're going to do at this site, which I don't feel is that good a site for housing at all. And with this design, you know, of, of housing over parking, for that reason, I, I wouldn't support this project today. But it, uh, um, I think that uh, I think they're doing the very best they can with that with that site and with the circumstances they have. Are there any other comments by members of the agency? Uh, I, I'd just like to um, say that the plan that was brought forward on the Del Monte site was a, uh, you know, a very attractive plan, got a lot of support from the neighborhood, got a lot of support from the council. The only way, way where it didn't get support was it was not financially feasible at that time. And I think as, as council members or as agency members here, we have to keep in our minds constantly uh, we do have a commitment to housing. We, uh, at, at the time we discussed that Del Monte site, I think one of the reasons we didn't propose uh, putting money in, because quite frankly, is we didn't have very much money at that time. Uh, it's not clear to me that in the future, within the next five years, we may not have more aff affordable housing funds coming online. But we are faced today with 220 units uh, of, 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 of which 40% will be affordable, a project that is doable, a project that has come forward and worked through uh, 
with some very uh, intelligent and some very uh, vocal residents right across the street who had concerns. Uh, I have to uh, say to Catellus that they did a wonderful job of not only working through and listening to those concerns, but also responding to the concerns. I will vote for this project because I believe we have a commitment to housing, and I think uh, we don't know what the future will hold. We don't know whether there will be a market for condominiums. The market for condominiums right now is not very good, but we have a commitment to affordable housing. If you look at our housing uh, element of the general plan, we have made specific commitments to housing. This is a project that could fill in 220 homes for people in this very small city. That's, uh, I think it's a good project. I think it's a sensitive design. And I, I, I also think that we cannot be too protective of people. People can make choices. If people don't want to live at Emory Bay 2, they don't have to live there. If they don't want to live at the Catella site, they don't have to live there. What is desperately needed is good, good quality living spaces. Let people make their own choices. Uh, I think this is what this council could provide if we go forward with this project. Do I hear a motion on the resolution? Um, before we... Oh. Sorry, just one minor. Um, before you consider the, the items, we had one... Uh, minor addition that I wanted to make to it appears that it as uh, attachment number seven to the participation agreement and it's in uh, section five page four of six of attachment number seven section five it, it's dealing with the housing trust fund and essentially we want to clarify that the the trust fund shall be deposited um, it says the trust fund shall be deposited by the agency into an interest-bearing account and shall be ex used exclusively for the housing development. And I want to add, under terms and conditions established by the agency, such that it's clear that the agency will will have control over how the, the terms and conditions under which it will grant loans from this trust fund. Did you have anything else, Mr. Benjamin? Um, to the extent uh, the council wanted to, or the agency, excuse me, wanted to consider um, language uh, regarding noise issues or uh, council members cast as concerns regarding the conversion plan, I've, I've tried to uh, jot some further resolves for the resolution. Um, Will you share them with us? Sure. Um, well. I guess first what I'd like to know is does the council want to impose some condition regarding noticing to tenants for uh, noise issues? Yeah. I wouldn't be in favor of that. Yes. That's two yeses and... I'm paying. That mean that I don't get that. That's two yeses and one no and one hasn't been... You have three yeses. Okay. I would just... Um, provide something along the lines that further resolve that as a condition of approval of the owner participation agreement that the participation agreement provide that the participant, which is Catellus, shall provide notice to tenants of the development regarding the development's proximity to retail establishments and other uses that may generate noise and other disturbances which tenants may find objectionable with such notice to be reviewed and approved by the agency general counsel or if the tenants are reading this, they'll probably find it damn patronizing, too. I mean, you can't see the shopping. Well, anyway, all right, go ahead. Uh, do you have further language? No, that would be it. All right. And then you wanted to put in a provision about if somebody was uh, convicted of felony drug trafficking? Well, there actually, I, there is language already in the, uh, the grant regulatory agreement that provides a screening process for, um, for the tenants, such that they would... Um, those that have those types of uh, convictions would be screened out. Okay. And, uh, and, and attempt, this, it uh, says to the extent allowed by law is what the provision allows. And, and um, Vice Chair Cassidy. Well, concerned. I was trying to recall all of. Um, I, I have the issue regarding um, placing the units out onto the market at the same time, such that the developer doesn't mm -hmm. hold them back. 
uh, that the development be upgraded? Is that what I understood at well, the time? Well, there, there were, you can all fill in and, and let me know here, but I, as I recall at the time of the conversion at Watergate, that as part of the condition for that, that that there were certain things that had to be done. Uh, can I, can I the, Yeah, would you stop? please, you've yeah. been wanting to talk. I've been living with this project for a year now on the housing committee mm -hmm. initially when they first presented it, and we've been working all these issues through. First of all, they're starting it out with a condo plan and right. building it to condo to standards. Condo standards. Unlike, Watergate. Unlike Watergate. Unlike Watergate. Right. Does I'm that resolve that. that issue for you? Well, it's just that that's all going to be 15 years old. You know, yeah, when well, they get ready to sell these things. Hey, my building is 12 years old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. that's like okay. I know. I, I know. Um, <laughs> that was one of your concerns. Your other concern was the one about uh, you know withholding them from the market. You're only talking about 80 units here versus 1,500 units, which is what Watergate had, because you can't the market rate units you're not necessarily dealing with. And let okay? me interject, Chris. We're not talking about great views anyway. And we're not talking about great views. I was going to say that next. Oh, and sorry. we're not talking about a developer who wants to hang on to it. They would love to sell them. You know, they are dying to do that and hope that the market will be there. The I'm, I'm in the title insurance business, so I know a little bit about some of this. Nobody is hot to buy any condominiums these days like they were in the 70s. I'm aware of that. And so all the market conditions have changed. The laws have changed. There's a lot of protection you know, for tenants first, right, to buy a condo before somebody could convert it, you know. And all of those issues that you keep bringing up over and over and over again, you know, okay. I, I know, I love you dearly, but you keep doing this. They are not happening anyplace else. They are not happen, didn't happen in my building, and they will never happen again. This was a lucky draw at the time, you know, on the project. But, this sort of thing will never happen again. The protections are built in on this project. Well, let, let me say that having the right of first refusal, which existed at the time Watergate converted, was no protection to the people where Watergate had those units come up for rent while we were going through the process. And 250 units never saw the market. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I, I know that. So that it can happen no matter what the law is. And, you know, basically, I'm a happy person if everybody's fair. And, and I'm assuming goodwill now because you've established that with us today. I don't know. I'm I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like in you know, 15 years. A lot and of so us will be here 13 years from if, now. If I could and be we assured, will be sitting there. All right, one at a time here. <laughs> if I could be assured that that the existing <laughs> residents were going to be treated fairly at the time of of, con of conversion, I would be fine with it. But I've seen where that didn't happen right here in this town, yeah. and it tore the town apart uh, for for this side of town for a lengthy period of time. And all I'm trying to do is work some protections for those people into what we're doing. Dick, last year they replaced 70 to tell us executives. So how could you have any assurance that, they, that these people are going to be here next Exactly, week? exactly. Could, that's, could, that's, could that's we perhaps point. hear from yeah. our council down here about protections for the the uh, renters? Well, yeah, I don't think there's much you can say about that, to tell you the truth. Well, but, uh, well, exactly, uh, 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 Madam could Mayor you? and members of the council. Um, I, um, one of the challenges with this project, quite frankly, is looking at looking out 15 years from now. What what can you really do? I mean, to me, one of the greatest challenges in this project was saying, okay, what what can we really do to increase the likelihood, the probability that number one, the units will convert, and number two, I mean that and that it's fees. I mean that it's feasible. I mean, that's why, I mean, the OPA and the corresponding documents focus on what I think staff believes were the two critical components. One, that um, we wanted to make sure that the, the units at the time they were built met condominium specifications. And we're relying on a very unique provision in the Subdivision Map Act that actually allows a map to be recorded um, at the time prior to the, to the issuance of a building permit in this project. And unlike typical subdivision map acts that would expire in a relatively short time frame, that this map will will continue throughout the life, the 15-year life, rental life of this property. So at the end of 15 years, there's going to be a valid subdivision map for condominium use on this property. So there's not going to be an issue with respect to use in terms of the, the, the ability for this project to become owner-occupied. That's the first issue. And then we go to the second issue, which was, 
are there going to be funds available to assist, particularly those lower income tenants, to, to truly realize the home ownership opportunity, hence the project trust fund concept. So that's kind of an economic incentive on the part of the developer to convert because there's dollars there and they forgo $1.4 million in the event they, they elect to kind of play, you know, not be serious about attempting to convert. The reason why those two items are in there is because when you start getting to kind of the, what I'll call the second layer of attempt at regulation, it's very, very difficult, number one, to, 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 to draft, quite frankly, in a way that has any meaning 15 years from now. And it will be even more difficult to enforce practically when you get there. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that we saw as being the best that we could do was requiring the prepar you know, preparation of a conversion plan that would have to come back to this body for its approval. Um, and the failure to provide such a conversion plan would constitute a default under the grant regulatory agreement, at which point in time the $3.5 million would be recaptured. So in short, I mean, that's really, from our standpoint, the best one could do without getting into some, some fairly um, um, challenging drafting, not so much that you couldn't write the words, but, but could you really enforce them down the road, keeping in mind that anything that we draft today is, is subject to an amendment uh, at the time the conversion plan actually comes forward for approval. I mean, that okay, would be Can I ask you a question about the conversion? Um, you know, it's conceivable when you're going to build a project that, that you need to get financing that, that's um, available because you don't have a project yet. But after it's built, I don't understand why after 15 years they couldn't be required to make the units for sale. Now, if nobody wants to buy them, then, then they would continue to rent it. But why couldn't they, after 15 years, make them automatically available for sale? Because it's already built. What would pre preclude that? They would need financing then. Again, it's 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 the market. But I'm saying if the if the market isn't there, then nobody will buy them. But that doesn't mean that they can't be required to make them available for sale. Like in an auction, you're talking about. Well, yeah, just but I, I don't understand why they couldn't be made required to make them for sale. You just have to set up like an auction-like mechanism, if nothing else. Yeah, if nothing else. But. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose, I mean, again, one, uh, one simple response to that, to that question is 15 years out from now, the project has been built in an operation for that period of time. Um, and, and let's suppose you had a clause that says that on this date, 15 years from now, you must absolutely, positively, regardless of what's going on in the world, um, offer these units for sale. And then the question becomes, okay, now, if you don't, Then what? Okay. Then you fill in the blank and say, okay. Then what happens? The, the tenant of the of the unit could could, could uh, insist that they sell it to him or something like that. I don't know. No, exactly. I guess the issue that I'm, it, the issue I'm raising it becomes a real impractical enforcement issue because if the reason why the developer owner isn't converting is because there's no market there for them to convert. And if the enforcement mechanism is to say, well, then we're, we want our $3.5 million back, irrespective of the fact that there's no market for you to actually convert these units, even though you've demonstrated that you want to, that's really what you'd be looking at. Mm -hmm. well, I think what he's saying is there is a market. It's just a question of what price. I mean, the Housing Authority of Alameda County buys condominiums out of auction all the time where somebody for a Lenders take it back property and auctions off a bunch of condominiums. And I, n I don't know if it, we buy them on a project that big. Well, there mind, you've are, there are mechanisms it. where you could set up and say, we will make you we we will make a market. Well, in some respects, you've 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 done that already. Um, the creation of the trust fund, quite frankly, creates an additional market potential that would not otherwise exist, particularly with the lower income units, because the the most likely impediment to the lower income tenants on the on the on the uh, income restricted units is going to be the lack of down payment and closing costs toward permanent loan financing 
which is what we anticipated, and, and, and that's the requirement. Okay, let, let me explain to you why, why it's so important, okay? Yeah. If, if, you know, the, the city of Berkeley has the government that it does because there's so many students there that vote that they outvote the people that, that own and, 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 and have property there. And this is a very small electorate. You take the Catellus Project as rental, take Emory Bay Apartments as rental, and then you take half of the condominium units that are out there that are also rental, and then you have a city full of renters. They could very easily impose rent control, and you could very easily have a whole different city government here than you have right now. And that's my concern. It's not easy to compose rent control yeah. anymore. Well, and the other thing, the other thing to keep in mind is that the that the that the notion of condominium ownership is by no means itself a panacea, because if you were to create an artificial market in these condominiums where they could be purchased so low, the net effect would be you'd have a lot of investor purchasers who would then in turn buy the unit and then rent it, and you'd still have a rental project. And, and you, have, uh, you have that particular condition existing at both the Pacific Park Plaza and, and Watergate. But, but you don't have tenants unions at Watergate and Pacific Park Plaza. You've got individual owners and individual renters, so that's yeah. a big difference there. Could, could I, could I, 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 I want to finish two points here, as we've gotten interrupted a couple times. I, and maybe you're the one to answer, and maybe it's somebody else. Uh, are there... Are there things required, of, or, or maybe you know, are there things required of the developer that need to be done at the time of conversion relative to the condition of the property? I, I don't know if there's law that, that sets that in place or not. We, if we were going to sell the units and having gone through this process before, uh -huh. um, we would want those units to look new. And right. so we would go in and we would put in... Um, you know, we'd, up, we'd put in new flooring, we'd probably upgrade the carpeting, we would uh, repaint the units. If the appliances weren't, uh, weren't in good shape after 15 years, we would, we would, from our standpoint, we would want to go in and make that unit look like it did today. Okay. And that's just from a marketing standpoint. And you know, we've done that. I know Saris Regis has done you know, thousands of, of condominium conversions. Our, our intent here is, is not to get out of the conversion. I mean, we have an incentive if the market's there to convert. And all, I mean, from my standpoint, you know, all I'm asking is that let let the market be there. If we go to auction, um, you're going to end up with exactly the situation that Mr. Harris referred to, which is which is investors. And I'd much rather have one management company managing 220 rental units than 50, you know, out of town or you know, offsite in, investors. Uh, owning units, you'll have Fannie Mae problems in terms of you know getting financing right. for the project. Um, well, it wouldn't be an issue to you if you told them, but that's okay. I, I beat the horse to death enough, so it's fine. Okay, I I, I want to. So what you're telling me is there's no law that requires you to do anything in particular in, um, in upgrading the units. It's going to be just market forces that are going to require that. That's that's correct. I mean, okay. we've we've built in nine foot ceilings, walk-in closets, um, washer and dryer hookups, all of the things that a homeowner is going to want, which right. you're not going to right. see in Emory Bay. So right. you know, those are the tip when you go in to convert a unit, those are the typical things that you would go in and do and those are very costly. We've already done that. Okay. So the only things that, that we would have to deal with when we went to convert would be noise attenuation <laughs> issues, in, you know, from a carpeting or right. flooring standpoint. Yeah. And uh, you know, as I said, bringing the unit back up to the standard that it was in Today, when when the project's completed. Okay, and let's go, let's go outside of the individual units to to the big ticket items. Uh, and I'm trying to think of of renters now become becoming owners, and now they're an, you know an association, mm -hmm. and now they've got to maintain the property. Uh, what about things like re-roofing? I mean, is that again is that something that you do only if the market requires, or are there things that would require you to have the, the well, common areas in a certain stage when it's turned over to the association? That, that becomes a, a significant liability issue, as you know. Most of the the, uh, the claims in in condominium projects is water damage. Um, if the roof leaks, we're going to know it before 15 years, and we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, if you know if it's still leaking at the end of 15 years. You know we're going to we're going to replace we're going to do whatever needs to be done because you're not going to convert a unit that's going to end up with water damage on the inside, in the walls, you know wherever. Um, we in essence have 15 years to work out those problems if if they exist. Okay, uh, maybe what I'm trying to get at is h how does a buyer coming in on year 15, uh, say somebody that's rented there for the last year, 
how do they know what liabilities as an owner okay. for the common areas they're taking on? We would, when, it, when you set up a condominium association, you do a reserve study. Right. And the reserve study analyzes, you know, does the building need to be painted? If not now, when does it need to be painted? Okay. And we have to, we have to raise so much money. All right. roof, roof is fine now. Ten years from now, it needs to be replaced. This is what it's going to cost on a time value of money basis. We need to, inv this is how much our association dues need to be. Landscaping, all of those things w are factored into a reserve study that becomes, you know, part of the condominium association binder, if you will, and serves as the as the roadmap to make sure that the project is maintained in the condition that it is when they moved into the unit. But is, is, is it up to, is there any money, on the day the association takes over, is there any money in the reserves for those things? If, if, it, it depends, Dick. If, if, you know, something's going to be needed a year from now, then you'd have to, you'd have to fund it up front because you would, that would be a cost of, of conversion. So the reserve study would come back, it would tell you how much money you would need when, if you don't have the individual owners in place to pay those dues, then it'd have to be funded in some other fashion. That's the main thing I'm trying to get, is that you don't end up with a project in somebody's laps and all of a sudden they've got to vote themselves a, a special assessment because two years after you're gone, you know, the roof leaks uh, and, and they've got to replace it or they've got to repaint the entire outside of, of, of the uh, project and they don't have the reserves to cover that. Dick, of course, the other alternative they have is to go to a lawsuit like um, yeah. Watergate did and like well, Pacific Park Plaza right. did. And I think people who who market condominiums uh, are very well well aware of that, and that's why the reserve study is state law, and why the, all these other protections are built in at a state level. Um, you, and, and you still have, you know, we've got lawyers surrounding us. We still have the last resort, which is going to the the law courts and suing people. I I really didn't understand how that process works, and it, and it sounds like there's some protections built in, but it. It still relies on a lot of good faith uh, as, as the developers exiting and, and the homeowners are taking over. And, and I guess what you're saying is your deterrent there is is you want to try to if, try to it, try to prevent a lawsuit, and you're going to do what needs to be done to get the association off and running well. You're going to go the extra mile, okay, to, to, to make sure that doesn't happen. All right. Just the other part of part of going that way is that they have to go through the Department of Real Estate. Mm -hmm and produce a, what they call a white paper, right. and I know as part of that they okay. require them to look at the reserves for the association regarding issues such as, you know, repairs to common areas and the right. like. And let me see if I can simplify my other concern and get down to a, a very simplistic protection which I would like to see written into the document, and it would be something as broad and I think not onerous as something that says essentially words to the effect that, that units will not be withheld from the rental pool that would therefore prevent someone from exercising their right of first refusal. That's that's the kind of protection I'm looking for because that's what happened across the street. So that as units become available and we're six months away from conversion, those units are not held out of rental. That people will be allowed to rent those units uh, so that they can exercise their right to buy there. That's the type of protection I'm looking to put in. Uh, do you do you have a problem with that conceptually, or and if there's some practical things about that, you sh you should tell me because uh, you know I'm trying to keep an open mind to it. But what, what kind of a partner in this though? We're, we're yeah, there, we're there, there, right? there's got to be some well, element of trust and faith here because clearly if if you're dealing with people who are uh, uh, you know are totally greedy and trying to rip people off what they'll do if the apartment comes vacant is put one of their own people in there to rent the apartment there, there, and there's no way you can possibly monitor that or prevent that there has to be some kind of element of trust and good faith when when we're dealing uh, with a developer and now I think uh, Steve and his team Certainly, from what we have seen in the last months, how they have worked with staff, how they have worked with the community, uh, have have demonstrated that credibility. They have the credibility. It's equally true that we don't know who's going to be there from Catellus or for for Regis uh, in 15 years. There are some things that are out of control of this agency. But would you respond <coughs> to my question if you can? I, Dick, I don't have a problem in concept. I mean, I understand what you're what you're trying to do, what you're trying to do in terms of, you know, 
obviously we would have to make a conscious decision to withhold right. withhold units from the market. Um, my, my preference would be to defer to the language that, that Mr. Harris has built in, that we have to come forward with a conversion plan that you know is is fair to the you know to the to the current residents and to the city of the you know to the city of Emeryville. Um, I just I don't maybe someone can come up with some language that would work. I I don't have the, the concept. I understand what we're trying to accomplish. The issue is how do we do it? I guess, I guess ultimately that that if in in uh, 15 years of the people sitting here aren't interested in these kind of protections. And, and and you and there's a different group of folks that, that could tell us that are on the greedy side. It doesn't matter that whatever whatever I guess we would pass now, they could change. Uh, I'd, I'd be and, more concerned and, and about the, matter, the so. future agency uh, <laughs> being. A well, that's that's, that's, that's right. part right. of that's part right. of why I'm I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do. So anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your candor. I would move approval. Do Check. I hear a second? Uh, call the roll, please. Agency Member Bukowski? Aye. Agency Member Harper? No. Vice Chair Cassis? Aye. Chair Davis? Aye. Thank you. <clears throat>